listening to you are listening to truth over comfort podcast with, with carlos morales and taryn harris brought to you by the blue ridge liberty project hey everyone this is carlos morales of truth over comfort we can be found at truthovercomfort.net sorry that we haven't had a new update uh recently i'm in the process of moving and i'm also in the process of getting some better mics so the sound might not be so great right now um what i'm going to be doing right now is a reading of an article by Stefan Kinsella. It's called Argumentation, Ethics, and Liberty, a Concise uh, Guide. Presently, I'm working on a video that will be breaking down argumentation ethics, you know, self-ownership, non-aggression principle, and private property in 120 seconds. And it turns out making something that concise can be a little bit of work. So look out for that soon. So the article starts. Professor Hans Hermann Hoppe burst onto the Austro-Libertarian scene in the late 1980s when he moved to the United States to study under and work with his mentor, Murray Rothbard. Since his arrival, Professor Hoppe has produced a steady stream of pioneering contributions to economic and libertarian theory. A key contribution of Professor Hoppe is his provocative argumentation ethics, defense of libertarian rights. In setting the stage, Hoppe first observes that the standard natural rights argument is lacking. This is from Hoppe in The Economics and Ethics of Private Property. It has been a common quarrel with the natural rights position, even on the part of sympathetic readers, that the concept of human nature is far too diffuse and varied to provide a detriment set of contents of natural law. Furthermore, its description of rationality is equally ambiguous in that it does not seem to distinguish between the role of reason in establishing empirical laws of nature on the one hand and normative laws of human conduct on the other. Hoppe's solution is to focus on the nature of argumentation instead of action in general. Again, Hoppe states, The praxeological approach solves this problem by recognizing that it is not the wider concept of human nature, but the narrow one of propositional exchanges and argumentation which must serve as the starting point in deriving an ethic. Here he draws on the work of his PhD advisor, the famous European philosopher Jürgen Habermas, and fellow German philosopher Karl Otto Appel, who had developed the theory of discourse ethics or argumentation ethics, as Hoppe explains this basic approach. Any truth claim, the claim connected with any proposition that is true, objective, or valid, all the terms used synonymously here, is and must be raised and settled in the course of an argumentation. Since it cannot be disputed that this is so, as one cannot communicate and argue that one cannot communicate and argue, and since it must be assumed that everyone knows what it means to claim something to be true, One cannot deny this statement without claiming its negation to be true. This very fact has been aptly called the a priori of communication and argumentation. That is, there are certain norms presupposed by the very activity of arguing. Appel and Habermas go on to argue that the ethics of presupposed as legitimate by discourse as such justify the standard set of soft socialist policies. But Hoppe, while recognizing the value of the basic approach, rejected their application of this theory in socialist conclusions. Instead, Hoppe took what was valuable in the April Habermas approach and melded it with Miesian, Rothbardian insight to provide a praxeological discourse ethics twist on the standard natural law defensive rights. In essence, Hoppe's view is that argumentation or discourse is by its very nature a conflict-free way of interacting, which requires individual control of scarce resources. In genuine discourse, the parties try to persuade each other by the force of their argument, not by actual force. Argumentation is a conflict-free way of interacting, not in the sense that there is always agreement on the things said, but in the sense that as long as argumentation is in progress, it is always possible to agree at least on the fact that there is disagreement about the validity of what has been said. And this is to say nothing else that a mutual recognition of each person's exclusive control over his own body must be presupposed as long as there is argumentation. Note again that it is impossible to deny this and claim this denial to be true without implicitly having to admit it's true. Thus, self-ownership is presupposed by argumentation. Hoppe then shows that argumentation also presupposes the right to own homesteaded scarce resources as well. The basic idea here is that the body is the prototype of a scarce good for the use of which property rights, i.e. rights of exclusive ownership, somehow have to be established in order to avoid clashes. 
The compatibility of this principle with that of non-aggression can be demonstrated by the means of argumentum a contrario. First, it should be noted that if no one had the right to acquire and control anything except his own body, then we would all cease to exist in the, and the problem of the justification of normative statements simply would not exist. The existence of this problem is only possible because we are alive, and our existence is due to the fact that we do not, indeed cannot, accept the norm outlawing property and other scarce goods next, and in addition to that of one's physical body. Hence, the right to acquire such goods must be assumed to exist. Hoppe then goes on to show, following Rothbardian logic, that the only ownership rule that is compatible with self-ownership and the presuppositions of discourse is the Lockean original appropriation rule. In his book review of Man, Economy, and Liberty, Essays in Honor of Murray and Rothbard, Hoppe pithily summarizes the argumentation ethics approach as follows. By engaging in discussion about welfare criteria that may or may not end up in agreement and instead result in a mere agreement on the fact of continuing disagreements, as in any intellectual enterprise, an actor invariably demonstrates a specific preference for the first use, first own rule of property acquisition as his ultimate welfare criterion. Without it, no one could independently act and say anything at any time, and no one else could act in independently at the same time and agree or disagree independently with whatever had been initially said or proposed. In it is the recognition of the homesteading principle which would make intellectual pursuits, i.e. the independent evaluation of propositions and truth claims, possible. And by virtue of engaging in such pursuits, i.e. by virtue of being an intellectual, one demonstrates the validity of the homesteading principle as the ultimate rational welfare criterion. Hoppe also gives credit to Rothbard for recognizing in a brief passage the insights that Hoppe later built on more systemically. This defense of private property is essentially also Rothbard's. In spite of his formal allegiance to the natural rights tradition, Rothbard, in what I consider his most crucial argument in defense of private property ethic, not only chooses essentially the same starting point, argumentation, but also gives a justification by means of a, a priori reasoning almost identical to the one just developed. To prove the point, I can do no better than simply quote him. Now, any person participating in any sort of discussion, including one on values, is by virtue of so participating alive and affirming life. For if he were really opposed to life, he would have no business continuing to be alive. Hence, the supposed opponent of life is really affirming it in the very process of discussion, and hence the preservation and furtherance of one's life takes on the statue of an incontestable axiom. Not surprisingly, when Hoppe's argumentation ethics appeared in the late 1980s, e.g. in the Libertarian Symposium and other publications, Rothbard was excited by this new approach. In a dazzling breakthrough for political philosophy in general and for libertarianism in particular, he has managed to transcend the famous Izzat fact-value dichotomy that has plagued philosophy since the days of these scholastics. And that had brought modern libertarianism into a tiresome deadlock. Not only that, Hans Hoppe has managed to establish the case for anarcho-capitalist Lockean rights in an unpredictably hardcore manner, one that makes my own natural law, natural rights position seem almost wimpy in comparison. Tantalizingly, Rothbard concludes his piece, a future research program for Hoppe and other libertarian philosophers would be, A, to see how far axiomatics can be extended into other spheres of ethics, or B, to see if and how this axiomatic could be integrated into the standard natural law approach. These questions provide fascinating philosophical opportunities. Hoppe has lifted the American movement out of decades of sterile debate and deadlock and provided us a route for future development of the libertarian discipline. Since the advent of Hoppe's breakthrough theory of rights, it has continued to gain attention and adherence, as well as controversy. I based my own related estoppel theory of libertarian rights on Hoppe's work starting in 1991 and ended up writing a detailed survey of related theories in New Rationalist Direction's libertarian rights theory. In the meantime, other work has built on Hoppe's monumental rights theory, so much so that I've been tempted to collect material for an argumentation ethics reader. And in the truthovercomfort.net site, you'll be able to find all those uh, different uh, sources for that particular project. Also, if you want, want to learn more about Estoppel and libertarian ethics in general, there is a libertarian ethics uh, episode in which I break it down in, I believe, somewhere in the early 20s. So definitely check that out. You can find it on the truthovercomfort.net page. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Stefan Kinsella, for writing this great article. 
I will be back pretty soon. Bye-bye.